Turtwig, the Tiny Leaf Pokémon, Grottle, the Grove Pokémon, and Torterra, the Continent Pokémon. Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional, and I hope you are too. In today's video, we will be seeing how quickly I can defeat Pokémon Soul Silver, including a bunch of post-game content, using only my starter, whom I will allow to evolve. Challenge rules are in the description. This video is going to kick off a little mini-series on my channel where I'm going to be exploring Soul Silver. There is a lot of content in these games, and as a result of that, I'm not going to be pursuing a second playthrough, at least in this initial series. Optimizing these playthroughs is absolutely something I see us doing in the future, but I'm just not feeling competent enough in this game yet. That's the whole point of this series, is to practice, 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 and open things up to all of you to let me know how I'm doing in this game. Please tell me everything that I do wrong. We're going to be following along with our starter series, with our first three videos in Soul Silver being the Gen 4 starters. The Grass starter is going to kick us off, and for a nickname, I actually found something pretty fun. While looking for a name inspiration, I stumbled upon the name Grastoise, and after playing Blastoise last week, I couldn't help myself. Another thing to mention is that I have not had the time to figure out Game Hook for Soul Silver yet, so I'll be using Pokelink, which I've been using for our streams up to this point. There's obviously some technical points I need to iron out, but I really just wanted to play Soul Silver. I'll just mention right now that you're gonna see some weird alignments, some weird black bars, and it's gonna crash out quite a few times throughout the run. I feel like I'm gonna be learning as much about this game as I am about troubleshooting this game. Among the crashes that we're gonna see with the Pokelink software, one of them is because I was trying to manipulate the time of day. I really don't like playing with the nighttime aesthetic, but it was important at the start of the run because I wanted to catch something specific. The catches that I want to be doing in this game are for four HM cheerleaders. The best I've come up with so far is catching Rattata and Geodude because they're both available super early. And on the other side of Violet City, I'm going to be catching a Wooper, which is why I wanted it to be nighttime. I don't need to catch a flyer because we're able to pick up Kenya for free a little bit later. First though, it is mandatory in Heart Gold and Soul Silver that you clear out the Bellsprout Tower, so let's do that. While going through the playthrough as well, there are going to be a bunch of battles that are kind of like mini-bosses, and I haven't really decided yet whether or not I want to give them the time of day. I feel like I'll stick with the mentality that I use with Giovanni and Silphco in Fire Red. If these battles don't give us a problem, I won't really cover them. After defeating Sprout Tower, we're able to challenge our first gym leader. The problem is that our first gym leader has a type advantage over us. I did defeat a scattered couple of extra trainers on the way here because I knew that we would have troubles. I just wasn't aware of how much yet. Let's jump straight into our first Faulkner attempt. We come into the battle at level 13. Unfortunately, we're one generation away from Tackle getting buffed, but it still seems to be doing about half damage. That's actually a lot better than I thought. Our biggest concern in this battle is actually our damage output. As always, I am super worried about sand attacks, and as long as our tackles are doing decent damage, we should be able to get away with it? Faulkner's totally legal level 13 Pidgeotto, though, has other things to say. I tried switching to Razor Leaf against Pidgeotto, and including a crit, it seems we're doing about a third. Faulkner keeps hammering away with Stab or same type attack bonus super effective Gus, knocking us into Overgrow range. Even with our grass moves powered up, we are dealing nowhere near enough damage. That's gonna be reset number one. After another battle that went even worse, I decided to go out and do a little bit of training. Ah, what the heck, while we're here, let's catch that Wooper. The reason that I went after Wooper is because it learns all three of the water-based HMs. Surf, Whirlpool, and Waterfall. After catching the Wooper, I can finally sort out a couple of those technical difficulties and change the run to day, though that's not gonna last very long. Ah, uh, would you look at that daytime aesthetic though, so much nicer. I also got the second component of Pokelink working, so you can actually see a little bit more information on screen. Don't worry, it breaks too right away. Back in the battle, we're starting strong with a critical strike, taking out Pidgey in a single shot. Our tackles are falling well short against Pidgeotto, looking like they're still only doing maybe a fifth. So I switch to Razor Leaf and an interesting thing happens. I have a new AI to learn the quirks of in this game as Pidgeotto starts going for Roost. The nice thing about Roost is that although Pidgeotto is healing himself, on the turn that he uses it, it gets rid of his flying type. 
That means that our stab razor leaps are hitting for neutral damage instead of resisted. We knock him down to about two-thirds health, then on the next turn we get a critical strike with razor leaf, ending the battle. As you can see though in the footage, Grastoise has 22 HP, whereas at the bottom, it still has 42. I won't figure this out for a little while, but for whatever reason, the software that I'm using to alter the time of day also seems to be messing with Pokelink. Technical, technical problems. I'm sure I'll figure out all this coding stuff eventually. I've been way too focused on the content itself lately. After defeating Faulkner, we're able to use Rock Smash, so I'm gonna be popping into the ruins of Alf. In this main area, there are a couple of smashable rocks that give us a chance for a couple of neat items. More specifically, I'm looking for the shards here so that we can take them back into Violet City and trade them with this juggler. We can trade the shards that we gather for a couple of useful berries like Chestos, Lums, even Citrus from Red Shards. It's one of those RNG problems where a Citrus Berry could completely change the trajectory of the early game, but you have to get lucky enough to find one. Either way, I felt that having a few berries at our disposal was never a bad thing. We're then heading south towards Union Cave and our next major city, Azalea, um, town. City, town, eh, it has a gym. I'm grabbing a couple of additional items along the way just because I don't really know what they are yet, but I knew that they were there. A super important item right at the bottom of this route behind three more of those Rock Smash rocks is the Shell Bell. It's going to restore one-eighth of the damage that we deal as healing back to us. I'm essentially going to be referring to it as discount leftovers, and as a solo runner, it is so useful. Speaking of useful things, in Union Cave, I'm first heading north to dip down the stairs. I had initially looked at Torterra's moveset and thought that we could learn TM39 Rock Tomb. Torterra can, but we're a little ways off from being fully evolved. Let's take a moment to enjoy a little bit more of that daytime aesthetic and ignore the fact that Grastoise is still level 14 at the bottom of the screen. Before doing anything else in this town, we have to help out Kurt in the Slowpoke Well. You know, I thought that we beat up the rockets enough in Kanto, but in Johto, it's looking like they're wanting some more. Along our path through the rockets, we level up to 18 and it's time for our first evolution. We're starting to look more and more like our Grastoise namesake as our shell grows. We get some great stat boosts, but one thing that Grastoise does not have an abundant amount of is speed. We all know that as solo runners, one of the most important stats is speed. This is also one of those mini-boss moments where we fight Proton for the first time. We'll see him and a couple of other named Rocket characters as we go through the run, but again, I don't think I'm gonna show them unless they're interesting. Not this time, buddy. I have to take a moment to just appreciate some of the design work in these updated gyms. Bugsy is going to be the bug type leader, again having a type advantage against us, but come on, this is just too much fun. Spider cart, spider cart, skittering along a track of ropes. Let's check out our second gym leader, Bugsy. Like I said, we have a type disadvantage here and his lead scyther is going to be an absolute menace. Rock Tomb would have been doing four times super effective damage here, but we can't learn it yet. I was a little bit lost at the start of the battle, just going for a tackle as Scyther uses U-Turn. U-Turn deals damage and allows him to switch out to Kakuna, who then takes our tackle. At level 17, we learned a setup move, Curse. Curse increases our attack and defense by one stage while reducing our speed by one stage. I was so used to Kakuna only knowing Harden that I decided, hey, let's go for a bunch, but he goes for Poison Sting, and we're poisoned. And with our current damage output being fairly lackluster still, we take too many turns and the poison damage eats us alive. Since it also increases our defense, in the next attempt I decided to go straight for Curse against Scyther. What follows is a really interesting encounter with Scyther. He went for Focus Energy this time, but then switches into Leer as I continue going for Curse. It seems I found my first AI loop as we continue setting up with Curse, increasing our attack stat while he continues using Leer, keeping our defensive stat pretty much neutral turn by turn. Once we're both ready to switch to the offense, he U-turns out, bringing Kakuna back out, and our tackles are doing a ton of damage. We still end up poisoned, but this time, including the recovery from the Shell Bell, it does not end up mattering. At the end of the battle, we end up perfectly at one-third health, 23 out of 69. Nice. I was really worried about this one when I saw that we could not learn Rock Tomb, but Curse and some janky AI won the day. 
on the way out of town were encountered with another rival battle, but in Generation 2, the rival is pretty lackluster, with the exception of this battle. We can carve through his team for the most part fairly easily, using resisted grass moves as the only ones that hit Ghastly, and once his Quilava hits the field, you'd think that we would be in a little bit of trouble. Speaking of janky AI though, Quilava, instead of dealing damage to us, seems dead set on using as many smoke screens as possible. I chose to face the team that would be strong against us, but at the end of the battle, we're still at full health. Moving next into the Ilex Forest, we have to save a couple of farfetched dizzizzizzizzizz? Wait, pause, what is the plural of farfetched? 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 We have to rescue two stick holding birds. The point that I was actually trying to make is that this is where, in the run, I discovered that the software changing the time of day was messing with Pokelink. It's not the end of the Pokelink crashes, but at least it's going to be active more of the time now. We can then continue through the forest with our eyes set on Goldenrod next. If we ever make it to Goldenrod. I mentioned this on stream the other day, but one thing about these newer generations of Pokémon that really gets my goat is the amount of mandatory blah 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 blah. In an initial egg experience of the game, all of this dialogue is super nifty to new players. I feel though that it detracts so much from the replayability because you're forced to sit here for minutes listening to dialogue that has no weight on the rest of the game. In my opinion, one of the best things about the Pokémon franchise is the replayability. This might be a big reason why I never really left Gen 3. I'm not really much of one to have my hand held. One gameplay mechanic to point out is that during nighttime, the guards along this route are active. They are not during the day. So I gotta do a little bit of an extra scoot to the left here to get past this guy. In Goldenrod, I'm running around grabbing a few things like the bike. We then have to go to the radio tower because in Soul Silver, gym leaders do not need to be at the gyms. Whitney's sitting here going, Oh my goodness, what's the difference between an apricorn and an apricot? When instead, she should be doing her job at the gym. We get our radio card and apparently this snaps Whitney back into reality, so she heads back to the gym. Let's challenge her next. Whitney is probably one of the most infamous gym leaders in all of Pokémon. It's not so much about her lead Clefairy, but her mill tank is a menace. Two uses of Razor Leaf bring down Clefairy with no issue, but let's talk about that mill tank. The run ender of run enders. Mill tank is wicked fast, so she's using that to her advantage, hitting us with a bunch of stomps, which are also causing flinches. The flinches alone are enough to take us out of this battle. Let's also remember the fact that she has a few super potions and milk drink, which also heals her. Like I said, Miltank the menacing monster. In the next attempt though, I'm gonna be leaning back on Curse. Since we're slower anyway, and Clefairy was such a non-issue this time, I set up two Curses against her. Now when Miltank hits the field, we're dealing just over half damage, which is enough to take her out in two shots. Much less baloney when all you have to do is hit through twice. I'd like to say that we collect our third badge, but Whitney breaks down in tears. Why are they so different if they're pretty much spelled the same? As I turn to leave, giving up on getting this badge, Whitney's woo girl goes, oh don't worry, she just does this sometimes. So we talk to her again and get the badge. Ugh, this new generation of gym leaders, no respect anymore. After finally collecting our badge, I pop next door in order to grab the squirt bottle. We're gonna be needing it in just a second. But first I'm popping into the National Forest in order to collect the Quick Claw. While held, the Quick Claw gives us a 20% chance to move first in our priority bracket, and as such a slow Pokémon, I can see that being beneficial. I'm also gonna grab the TM for Dig while we're here, but I'm not gonna show everything that I do. Otherwise, this video would be like four hours long. I then use the Squirt Bottle on the pseudo wood wiggly tree thing that blocks the way to our next town, city. Wait, looking it up, Ecrutic City. One of the new mechanics introduced in this generation is the dousing machine. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but there are quite a few hidden items that can be spawned in a radius of area. A prime example of that would be the rare candy in the corner of Ecrutic City. If you divert your attention to the bottom left of the screen, you can see on the radar that there's a tiny dot that appears in the middle. I can then move around and watch how this dot moves to pinpoint exactly where that item is. I won't be relying on it a ton in these runs, but it is a very nifty mechanic to be aware of. Picking up this rare candy, though, is the one and only time I'll be showing using the dousing machine in this run. 
In order to face our next gym leader, Morty, we have to clear out another rival battle in Burn Tower. That thing I said about the rival not really causing problems? Well, apparently in Gen 4, he's got a little bit smarter. His lead Ghastly uses Curse on us, and that is pretty much the battle. Our damage output is not high enough to get this done in three more turns. That's just one of the problems though, this rival battle is actually quite a challenge. If things line up and we actually make it further into his team, remember, we are really weak to Quilava. Not only from a type perspective, but he's also attacking us with Ember, targeting our much weaker special defense. After a few attempts, we finally make it to his final Magnemite, and oh boy. By the end of this battle, we're paralyzed, confused, and pretty deep into Red Bar, but we do see success. As we approach three quarters of an hour in this run, with only three badges still, I find myself wondering, is this a Gen 4 problem, an exceptional problem, or a grass type problem? With the rival out of the way though, we can check out our next gym leader, Morty. A really nice thing about this grass type is that we do get some amount of coverage as we level up. I'm talking of course about Bite right now, but later we will be getting Crunch. Bite is going to serve as a super effective option against all of Morty's team, but it's not that simple. We can carve through his lead Ghastly and Ace Gengar with no problem at all really, but then the Haunters come out. Haunter 1 puts us to sleep, and then we sit there snoozing away while Dream Eaters take us apart. We do manage to take out this Haunter, but at only 17 hit points, the final Haunter outspeeds and Nightshade ends the battle. Remember those rocks that I smashed at the start of the game? Well, the blue shards gave us Chesto Berries. I have one of those Chesto Berries equipped in the next attempt, and let's see how it plays out. Haunter 1 goes for Hypnosis again, but this time he just misses. Well shucks, if only we couldn't have had that outcome last time. Bite one shots, and then Haunter 2 comes out laying a curse on us this time, but Bite once again acts perfectly well to clean him up. We collect our fourth badge, and here's hoping that progress starts speeding up. One thing that I'm not aware of that I might have to test next run is whether or not releasing the Legendary Beasts is mandatory. I feel that not releasing them would probably help to save more time. Not just in the animation itself, but in the fact that even under the effects of Repel, I can still be caught by the roamers. We're not going to reset or anything because of this, but it is just wasted seconds. We're then quickly down in Olivine City, where we have to go up to the top of the lighthouse to figure out that Amphi has a problem. Again, collecting any useful items that I know about, like the rare candy and the hidden hyper potion once we're back inside. Let's just avoid Dennis here. Okay, sweet. With that out of the way, we can now head across the sea to challenge our next gym leader, Chuck. Oh, wait, apparently not. Someone forgot to collect, surf. Back to Ecritique, I guess. On the way back, I get tagged by another optional trainer, which is good and bad, I guess. Good because we level up to 32 and are ready to evolve once again. Bad because we're backtracking and just wasting time right now. To expand on my question whether it's a heart gold, exceptional, or grass type problem, I think it's actually all three. We finish evolving gaining the dual type, so we are now grass and ground, and as a little bonus to that, we also learn Earthquake. Oh yeah, stab earthquakes, be still my beating heart. Right, back in Ecruteek in the dance theater, we beat up one rocket and collect Surf. Let's jump right ahead to our fifth gym leader, Chuck. In my first ever playthrough of Soul Silver, which you can check out in my stream VODs, Chuck surprised me. For only having a Polyrath and a Primeape, he's really strong. Grastoise, though, might have something to say about that. His lead Primeape opens with Double Team, but we hit through with a single Stab Earthquake for the one-shot. Holy Wrath is next, so I switch to Stab's super effective Razor Leaf. Turn 1, we deal over half, while his Body Slam pretty much just bounces off of us, but does get the Paralysis. And on turn 2, we end the battle. Gosh, it feels nice to come into a battle that I was a little bit worried about and just win. Chuck falls, so after making sure to grab HM2 Fly and the Secret Potion for Amphi, we can fly back to Olivine. It's then a quick trip back to the top of the lighthouse so that we can feed Amphi the potion so that Jasmine stops being distracted. I would continue to complain about how the gym leaders simply are not doing their jobs in this game, but at least Jasmine has a legitimate excuse. She's not at the gym solving the lighthouse problem. Whitney was just off trying to listen to new music on her radio. I haven't even mentioned Claire yet. Let's check out how Jasmine goes. 
really, really good. After evolving and getting access to Stab Earthquake, Jasmine went from a questionable battle to a guaranteed. Stab, four times super effective Earthquake will absolutely annihilate both of her Magnemites, with the real problem being against her Steelix. He's a defensive wall, but even so, it only takes three shots to bring him down. Her. Steelix is a her. This definitely feels like one of those dwarves in Lord of the Rings moments. I guess we can give Steelix sexy credit for that long, slender body? With spikes. Alright, I'm reaching at this point. Jasmine is out of here. That's two quick badges. Let's keep moving. Our journey now leads us east towards the Lake of Rage. It's time to jump into the second and easily most tedious part of the rocket plotline. I feel like this was definitely improved in the remakes, but it's still just a long, tedious section where you have to fight a bunch of low-level rockets. In the remakes, at least, some of the battles have been jazzed up, but we'll get to those. For the sake of brevity, and because we have a lot of run left to cover, I'm gonna be skipping the majority of this segment. We will cover it in future videos. Instead, after helping Lance and clearing out the health food store's hive-like basement, I'm gonna skip right ahead to our next gym leader, Price. Price suffers from a problem that a lot of Ice-type trainers suffer from. His entire team shares a dual typing with something that we're strong against. As such, the Ice-type leader that we boast a 4 times weakness to is not gonna end up being that threatening. His lead seal is out of there in a single Razor Leaf, and we barely miss the one-shot against Dugong. He responds with an Aurora Beam, taking us to 69 health. Nice. But we finish him off on the next shot. Let's just take a moment to appreciate the healing that Shell Bell offers. It's not a huge amount of healing, but over the course of a run, I'd be interested to know just how many hit points it recovers for us. With the water types out of the way, his Ace Pilot Swine has the ground typing, which is once again weak to grass. The one bit of luck in this battle is the fact that Piloswine misses Blizzard, which I think would have taken us out from this range. We aren't gonna find out today though, as we claim our seventh badge. Back in Goldenrod City, we're continuing the rocket plotline. Again, I will cover all of this in a future video, but for today, I'm gonna skip the majority of it. I just have to point out though, this rival, like what is with him? I had to defeat Price first in order to unlock this rocket costume, and I have it for all of about 30 seconds before our rival comes up and says, Hey, that's not right, completely blowing our cover. Then after doing that, he just kind of runs off. Dude, you're awful. Another bit that I will show though is our battle against Petrel. This guy has a full team of coughing and wheezing. The worst part about that evolutionary line is that they have the ability Levitate, which means that our Earthquake cannot hit them. As such, I'm forced back into moving moves like Headbutt, which are not dealing great damage. Between accuracy shenanigans and our weakness to poison, this battle could be a problem. Turns out all we needed was a little bit of luck to line up. I've switched from using Headbutt to using Bite. This targets the coughing's much weaker special defense, but also comes with a nice 30% chance to flinch. After a couple of resets, apparently all this battle needed was a whole bunch of flinch luck. We can two-shot his coughings, but after getting away from wheezing, we were only at about a third health. That includes a flinch against the wheezing. Through the last section of the battle, though, we get the flinches right when we need them, being able to take a couple of additional shots and finish the battle. When I was playing this, I was seriously concerned that I was going to be stuck here for a long time. This was the only sticky point in the rocket plotline during this playthrough, so once again, I'm just going to skip the rest of it. After clearing it out, our journey leads east once again towards Blackthorn and our final badge. Our journey takes us through the Ice Path, which is definitely an area that I spent some time in while learning. I'm far from perfect, but I've definitely figured my way through these ice puzzles, I think. I would just like to complain once more about the hand-holding. Even if you go and collect HM7 Waterfall before passing the guy at the top end of the route, he stops you anyway to ask, Hey, did you get Waterfall? I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I fail to see what this adds to the gameplay experience. I feel like I've complained a bit too much though. Look at this game, it is gorgeous. I may be scratching my head over a couple of gameplay choices, but the artwork is beautiful. Let's move on to our eighth gym leader, Claire. Claire, along with some other gym leaders in the remakes, is actually, again, pretty scary. 
Her dragon types resist the majority of incoming damage and has great coverage to back it up. Also, her lead Gyarados is going to intimidate us at the start of every battle, reducing our attack by one stage. Our Razor Leaves leave Gyarados at a sliver as she is beating us up with Dragon Rages. After healing, Claire then decides to withdraw Gyarados, sending out Dragonair instead. Even with the additional damage from our Razor Leaf, Earthquake cannot get the one-shot at minus one attack. Dragonair responds with some super effective fire blasts, and the battle doesn't go on much longer from there. I wiped once more playing around with ideas, and then in the third attempt, we get a critical strike against her lead Gyarados. This ignores the attack drop, taking her out in a single shot. Then, when Dragonair comes out, I felt secure in setting up a single curse. With a curse set up, I was hoping that Earthquake would now one-shot, and as long as we don't get burned by Fire Blast, it should be okay? Yep, it is all good. Stab EQ now takes out Dragonair in a single hit, and against her Ace Kingdra, it seems like we're dealing well over half. That again works out perfectly as her Citrus Berry recovers her, but the next shot takes her out. Then it's one final Stab Earthquake to finish off her final Dragonair. Grastoise has completed the gym challenge, but there's a problem. For the third time in this game, we have a gym leader neglecting her duties. We were clearly victorious in that battle, but she refuses to give us the badge until we go and prove ourselves with Big Daddy Dragon Master. He asks us a couple of questions to see if we're a main character or a villain, and we pass the test. Claire's like, oh my goodness, I just got off the phone with Whitney and we were talking about apricorns, but ugh, if you're worthy, I guess. There's our gym badge. Okay, you'd think that our next stop is the League, but we've got a little bit more to do first. Another change that was made in Generation 4 as compared to Generation 2 is that the sequence of battles in the Dance Theater is moved to much later in the game. Instead of facing these evolutions in the 20s, they're all leveled up to almost 40. You have to defeat all five of them in a row, and you do not get any reprieve to heal in between battles. This was another gauntlet that has given a couple of my practice runs quite a bit of problems. The type diversity and the strength of the evolutions cannot be discounted, especially in a game where all of their mechanics have been deepened to make them a little bit more dangerous. Or maybe I'm just being butthurt because they've owned me so many times already. For Grastoise though, we're once again gonna see a section that I was coming into absolutely dreading, but Stab Earthquake pretty much handles everything. One-shotting that initial Umbreon pretty much guarantees the win here. It's actually only Espeon and Jolteon that outspeed us, with Espeon's Psychic pretty much bouncing off of us as our Shell Bell recovers all of that health. And against Jolteon, what's he gonna do? We're Ground-type. Completing this gauntlet then allows us to move down to the Whirl Islands next. Down in the Whirl Islands, I'm once again gonna complain about non-skippable cutscenes. I noted while I was playing this that I am playing at four times game speed, and right now the footage is slightly accelerated. There's no debating that this cutscene is beautifully put together, but why isn't it skippable? I mean, the atmosphere, the energy in here as the Kimono Girls are dancing, going through this great sequence, Lugia bursts from behind the waterfall. Like, this is amazing. Despite how beautiful this is, I don't want to watch it a hundred times. I feel like once again, it's only going to contribute to artificially inflating my run times. I just want to note that this right now is unlocking the leagues finally, whereas in my Fire Red playthroughs, most Pokémon have completed the game by now. I want to say that in overall progression, we're maybe halfway through right now? I'm gonna skip right by the entire process of getting into Kanto and going through Victory Road, just showing that yes, we had another rival battle, but we one-shot him entirely. Then, somewhere in this League entrance, I know that there's a rare candy. Just gonna run in circles for a second here. Yep. Ah, there it is. All right, let's check out how these first Leagues go. Will kicks us off. I need to once again compliment Grastoise's learn set. We may not have the most options in the world available to us right now, but having grass, ground, and dark coverage with Crunch is pretty great. Crunch is gonna do some amazing work against our first Elite Four member, Will. We take out his lead Zatu in a single shot, but then Jinx comes out, freezing us right off the bat. We sat there frozen, getting punched in the head until we're unconscious. That's not exactly an auspicious start. In the next attempt though, Jinx does not freeze us and Crunch one-shots. 
In fact, in this entire battle, there isn't a ton to commentate on because I pretty much just keep the cursor on crunch and win. Obviously, our damage ranges could be a little bit better, so if I was pursuing a second playthrough, I might aim to be level 55 or even 58 here. Even so, despite the reflect from Executor and the myriad of turns that we take against Slowbro as she continues setting up some curses of her own, we do see a successful battle. In the very last turn, I switched to Razor Leaf for the increased chance to critical strike, which would bypass all of that setup, but eh, we get the knockout anyway. Let's check out member two, Koga. I once again would like to point out how great having early access to the Shell Bell has been. This is another battle where we're going to be dealing just enough damage to heal ourselves outside of danger. We're going to be relying on Stab Earthquake a lot again, even using it against Venomoth. Child me would not understand, Venomoth has wings. Bug, poison, flying, dark, steel, dragon, Scott thing. It's against Crobat that we see a little bit of bother as Koga begins setting up a bunch of double teams. It takes a bunch of turns and a few misses, but we do take out Crobat. I then switch back to EQ against Fortress as he's doing silly things like protecting and hitting us with Swift for not a lot of damage, taking him out as well. Koga's final Pokemon is a Muck in the back, which of course gets absolutely shaken down by a stab, super effective Earthquake. Alright, not a bad league so far. Two members down, let's check out Bruno. It's funny after playing so much Fire Red, seeing Koga and Bruno in the Elite Four together. Bruno even slightly promoted, I guess, as the third member instead of the second? His team is better this time, leading with a Hitmontop instead of an Onix, but most of his improvements were in his moveset. Grastoise, though, is not gonna be bothered. I'm gonna give a slight spoiler here in that we do see a successful battle this time, but this is not the last time we're gonna be facing Bruno. I refine the process a little bit, going for a curse on turn one in future battles, but in this battle, I pretty much just hit Stab EQ and win. Grastoise is much more physically inclined after all, and so is Lance's team, so our defenses are A-OK. -okay. That's the third member down, let's check out Karen. Oh boy, Karen. We've had a pretty decent time in the league so far, but Karen is gonna put up a serious wall for us. Stabby Q continues doing great work against her lead Umbreon, but it's the rest of her team where we start having problems. She sends out Murkrow next, and our best option against it is a resisted crunch. Murkrow responds with a series of stab super effective plucks. On top of being confused, we're also hitting ourselves a ton, so by the time we take out Murkrow, we're pretty beat up. 46 health for Houndoom, who outspeeds going for Flamethrower? Um, no problem? Five resets later, and I've tied into our rare candies at last, leveling up to 58 over a few damage rounding thresholds. This, coupled with a critical against Murkrow, is gonna help us through the battle. The critical doesn't help a huge amount, but it does get rid of another full restore. Houndoom hits the field, and we're at about three quarters health. At this level of health, it seems that we're outside of flamethrower range, so Houndoom sets up a nasty plot while Stab's super effective Earthquake wrecks her day. Gengar is next, hitting a Focus Blast for a fairly impressive amount of damage, but we take it out with Crunch. Then against Vileplume in the back, things get very scary. She ends up paralyzing us as our EQ fails to one-shot, and after a few more turns, we end up at 20 health, paralyzed, but we do see a successful battle. So what's up, Exceptional? You said we'd be facing Bruno again. Well, with the Elite Four down, we have one final trainer to discuss in round one. The champion, Lance. Lance is gonna be a bit more challenging. His lead Gyarados is going to intimidate us at the start of every battle, and as a physical attacker, that's not very good. I'm pretty woefully low on power points at the moment anyway, but I thought I'd take a shot at the battle regardless. Our Razor Leafs are doing pathetic damage to Gyarados. Meanwhile, as opposed to Fire Red, Gyarados is quite a bit more threatening, using super effective Ice Fangs to tear us apart. After a couple of attempts, I end up getting a fairly lucky battle against the Gyarados, allowing us to actually see something beyond it. Charizard is out next, ending the battle with a stab super effective Air Slash, arguably less powerful than Flamethrower. Seeing this definitely encouraged me to just take the reset, go back to the start of the league, and come up with something a little different. 
this is part of why I wanted to release a mini-series before getting into trying to optimize this game. Because this game is quite a bit more challenging than Fire Red, I've had to think about my rule set. Given the overall difficulty of the runs that I've completed in Soul Silver so far, I am very tempted to allow an egg move all the time. Another thing that we had discussed on stream in my initial playthroughs is giving myself a budget, both in the Game Corner in Goldenrod City and also in the Battle Frontier. An unfortunate part about this is that Swords Dance is available from the Game Corner very early, so that would change a lot of run trajectories. The reason that I want to give myself a budget in these places is that it opens up a lot of tutor and TM options. This methodology would definitely be more geared towards strategic diversity, interest, and fun in the runs as opposed to grinding out what would be a vanilla experience. Don't get me wrong, I love Minesweeper, but a couple hours of Voltorb flip every run doesn't sound very fun. Anyway, in these initial runs I am going to allow it simply for that fun factor, but I am going to hold off for as long as I possibly can. My aim here is to replace Curse with Swords Dance, which should make a significant impact on our ability to set up. Jumping ahead a few minutes and we're back in the Lance Battle after grinding the League a little bit. Our initial attempts here were at level 58 with Curse instead of Sword Stance, so let's see how much of a difference this makes. I've kept the Shell Bell on in order to get that little bit of additional healing throughout the battle, and I found that despite the risk of getting hit by Ice Fangs, it's worth setting up two SDs at the start of battle, boosting us to plus three after the Intimidate. Powered up and surprisingly fast, we end up taking out Gyarados and Charizard in a single shot. It's time for the Dragonites to start coming out. Yes, he has three in this battle. And we continue one-shotting, but we miss the one-shot against his Ace Dragonite. We then get tagged with a massive Fire Blast, dropping us down to 50 HP. Thank you, Shell Bell. Aerodactyl is one of the fastest Pokémon in the game, so he outspeeds, hitting a stab super effective Aerial Ace, dropping us to one hit point. Oh, my little egg-shaped heart, I can't handle this stress! Aerodactyl falls with the following Razor Leaf, bringing out his final Dragonite. Come on, one shot! We got it. With that, the Round 1 Pokémon League is finished, but I intend to push into Round 2. There's a lot of content left in this game. A disappointing part of Generation 2 was the Kanto section of the game. I loved the idea of a post-game and being able to go back to Kanto to explore, but the level curve was awful. The remakes have tuned things up a little bit. Grastoise clocks in with a round one time of 2 hours, 2 minutes, and 38 seconds at level 64, not 53 because the overlay's broken again with 24 resets. This took 6 hours and 28 minutes of game time. Again, for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna skip over the whole boat ride over to Kanto, so here we are in Vermilion! Hello! Given that we're introduced to the region right next to a gym leader that we have a type advantage against, I'm gonna jump right into it. So let's start our Kanto adventure by challenging Lieutenant Surge. I did mention that the level curve was a lot better in the remakes, but we are still outleveled here. In the remake, Surge's team are in the high 40s and low 50s for level, as opposed to the mid to low 40s. Their learn sets have definitely also been upgraded, but we're gonna get to that once we find a battle that gives us some problems. Um, if there's a battle that gives us some problems. Stab, super effective, sometimes four times super effective earthquakes absolutely tear through Lieutenant Surge's team, giving us our first Kanto badge. After a quick stop in the Poke Center to restore our earthquake PP, we're then heading north and poof, we're in Saffron City, ready for another gym leader. Let's take on Sabrina. Sabrina's team hasn't actually really changed from Generation 2, but it has been buffed again by about seven levels. Once again, our physical land turtle is going to absolutely shred through her team because we have super effective crunch. It just feels so fitting to me that after all of the times that I say that hard-hitting physical moves take out Sabrina in Fire Red, in our first run of Soul Silver, crunch, which is now physical instead of special, absolutely wipes her out. I have loved Crunch as a move since I first came across it in Generation 2. Bite is totally lame compared to some crunchy goodness. Sabrina falls and we have a bit of a fork in the road. In the post-game section of Kanto, this is the point where we have quite a few options as to where we can go next. There is one progression plotline that we have to finish in the Power Plant. 
Those pesky rockets have been added again, so from Saffron we head north once again, entering Cerulean City. I could head straight to the gym, but big shocker, we have another gym leader who's absent. Instead, I pivot east along Route 9 and 10, heading towards the power plant. We have to talk to the main dude in the pink shirt first, before the guard at the front becomes active, telling us that there's a shady person back in Cerulean City. Let's just ignore how much I dislike the nighttime aesthetic because we're going into the gym next. Not, of course, to face a gym leader or anything silly like that, but to chase down Rockets, who's hidden a piece of equipment here. Oh no, I'm caught, run away, so we follow him. We catch up to him along Nugget Bridge and oh no, where did he go? Oh wait, there he is. We beat him up and then I continue along the bridge towards Route 25 and Soul Silver's version of the Nugget Bridge Gauntlet. And finally, just beyond that gauntlet and Bill's house, we finally find our gym leader. Misty's sitting here at makeout point like, oh my god, responsibility is so hard. As a strange thing, have you noticed that all of the gym leaders I've complained about are female? I guess they're just a little bit more involved in the world around them than the male gym leaders that stand there all day going, Come at me, bro. But after our encounter with Misty up on Route 25, we're back in the gym and hey, everybody showed up to work today. Before taking on Misty herself, I'm diverting over to this little pile of floaties on the left side. Inside them, we can find that piece of equipment that the rocket stole from the power plant so we can get two birds stoned at once. We have another type advantage in Misty's gym, but I'm about to get a little bit of a reality check. Her lead gold duck ends up confusing us as we wipe the floor with it, bringing out Lapras. On the first turn, at full health, I hit myself in confusion, exposing us to a stab super effective ice beam from Lapras. That leaves us at nine hit points. Okay, right, Kanto gym leaders got a little bit of an upgrade. That's gonna be a reset. In the next attempt, I decide to set up with a single SD at the start of battle, while Golduck uses Disable this time. I'm at plus two, so Sword Stance being disabled means absolutely nothing to me. Stab super effective Razor Leafs then tear through Misty's team. After looking at the differences between the teams between Gen 2 and Gen 4, it just seems that most of them got powered up by seven levels. Beyond that, a tweak here, a tweak there, but seven levels is pretty impactful. Even when they're all getting one shot, I want as much experience as possible because we have a red battle looming in the future. Misty falls and that is our third badge in Kanto. I quickly pop back east in order to give that part back to the power plant, which unlocks the rest of Kanto. Almost. We have to go to Lavender Town first to talk to the director and tell him that we solved his power problems. Thank you, small child. Here, for your efforts, I will unlock the Poke Flute radio station. Sweet. What does this actually do for us? Well, nothing yet, actually, because I'm heading west after turning that in into Celadon City next. The nice part is, is that Kanto does fly by in this game. Or at least it feels like it does. Let's take on Erica next. We have a neutral matchup in this battle, so of course I'm gonna be relying a little bit on Swords Dance. After just one turn of setup, Jump Bluff starts making the smart plays, getting the heck out of my way, using U-Turn to pull out Victory Bell. One shot. Jump Bluff is back out, using U-Turn once again to bring out Blossom next. Critical one shot. Jump Bluff is back out and we finally connect with it with a plus two crunch, taking it out for the one shot. This also levels us up to 69. Nice. The more defensive Tangela is last surviving a crunch, but it's Tangela. It can't do much to us, so we take it out on the next shot. Erica falls for our fourth badge in the region. Continuing to ignore what the power plant plot unlocked for us, I'm heading west again towards Cycling Road. It, like many things in the region, has been updated since the last time we saw it in Fire Red. It's a pretty quick scoot down there to Fuchsia City. We can keep hammering out progress in Kanto, jumping straight into the gym. I kind of like how all of the trainers are meant to look like Janine here, it's, it's very ninja-esque. Aside from the shortcut in the top right corner that exists in Fire Red, nothing else changes about this room, so I go along the same path as I have for 20 plus years to the real Janine. Let's take on Koga's daughter. We have a type disadvantage in this gym, but we are 20 levels over leveled. Janine is definitely the one that got the most love in the remakes. Her team in Generation 2 was in like the mid-30s, I think? Like, why is your post-game region weaker than the Elite Four it takes to unlock it? I, I don't understand, but anyway. 
things start looking a little sticky against her lead Crobat as it confuses us. I didn't bother with any setup, just going for two crunches to bring it down, thankfully not hitting ourselves in the process. Now that the flyer is out of the way, we can revert back to Stab Earthquake to just pound away at the rest of her team. Two Ariadoses and a Venomoth stand no chance. As always, when I'm on a rampage with Earthquake though, suddenly there's a levitating Pokemon in front of me. I would love to hit him with a Stab super effective Earthquake, but Levitate makes that impossible, so against Weezing, I go back to Crunches, and I finish the battle in two more turns. That's our fifth badge. Now we head back to Vermilion City where we started our Kanto adventures to finally implement our radio. Just to the east of town is, as is usual in Kanto region, a sleeping Snorlax blocking the road. We can tune our Poke Gear to the Poke Flute channel and then click on the Snorlax. Snorlax wakes up and I run away, so now we have access to the rest of the Kanto region. After a quick jaunt through Diglett Cave, we have access to Pewter City. Here lies the Brock-type leader, Rock. Maybe he should have Ice and Rock-type Pokémon, you know, because he's Burr Rock. Let's go after what would typically be your first badge in this region. I hate to say, but once again, there isn't much for me to say in this battle. I'm not really sure on how to handle these Kanto gym leaders as we are overleveled and typically will be by the time we get to them. As we saw against Misty, it's not that we're completely out of danger here, but there really isn't a ton in the region that threatens us until later. Brock's entire team is either Rock Ground or Rock Water, so our grass moves are dealing four times super effective damage against all of them. He falls. I will note that Razor Leaf has been pretty much our grass stab move of choice since the beginning of the game. I do have the option at this point of taking a heart scale to the move relearner to learn Wood Hammer, which has a hundred base power instead of 55, but I just didn't see that as being necessary. Yet. I tend to dislike moves that come with recoil damage. Brock falls, leaving two gym leaders left in Kanto. Continuing south from there through Viridian Forest and Viridian City, there is another gym in this city, but we have our first male absentee gym leader. He's actually hiding out on Cinnabar Island where we're heading next. As we do a little wave by, I'm not gonna stop here to talk to Blue because first we have to loop around the island and then continue back east to the Whirl Islands where Blaine has now set up his gym. Blaine right now is like the ultimate sit in a corner come at me bro gym leader, whereas Blue, Blue in my opinion has always had a flair for the dramatic. Speaking of the little hole in the wall gym leader, let's take on the fire leader next. So I will admit to getting owned by Blaine a couple of times, but not in this run. Grassoise's typing has actually been a lot of fun to play with because most of the problems that Grass faces are solved by ground. Or, you know, ground adjacent things like rock. I have a whole set of stab super effective earthquakes ready to take on Blaine's whole team. We outspeed and one-shot his first two members, but then his final Rapidash actually outspeeds us. It uses Overheat on the first turn with its held White Herb guarding against the special attack drop. Little strategies like this are definitely something I need to be more aware of in these remakes. We survive at about a quarter health, taking out his ace. With that, we collect our seventh badge in Kanto and 15th in total. Now we can go back to Cinnabar Island and talk to Blue. Yes, yes, a volcano went off here, all of that. Go do your job, man. He says that he'll meet us back in Viridian Gym, so let's jump into our final gym leader of this video, Blue. Blue's lead executor is a gigantic troll. When he's not busy putting you to sleep, usually the first thing that executor does is set up a trick room. Trick Room is an interesting one in that for the next five turns, the slower Pokémon is going to be the one that goes first. This works quite well for Blue's team, actually, and given that we're also a slow Pokémon, you'd think that it would help us, but we're 15 levels higher than his team. At this level, even our big slow Land Turtle is faster than these guys. As you can see, we're unable to one-shot the Executor, so he's able to get up all of his shenanigans against us, setting us up for a knockout against his second Pokémon, Arcanine, when it comes out. That also just so happened to be on the last turn of Trick Room, if you noticed. Ugh, so close. After several resets, this is what I've come up with. 
Executor is a big problem for us in this battle, simply because of those twisting dimensions. Also, his biggest damaging move against us is Neutral, Leaf Storm, but it also drops his special attack by two stages every time he uses it. I try to use this to my advantage, stalling as much as I can setting up Swords Dances to try and run out the Trick Room timer. You can see my held Chestoberry as the number one thing that's been tripping up this strategy has been Executor using Hypnosis. We max our setup at about a third health, but we take down Executor as the dimensions transition back to normal. Now though, we are super set up, and faster than his entire team. This battle definitely took a little bit of finessing to nail down, and since it increased our overall reset count by almost one and a half times, I'd say that we're gonna have to look out for Blue in the future. Defeating him and collecting our 16th badge unlocks the round two versions of this Pokemon League. On top of their teams being powered up, they also all have full teams of six Pokemon. Let's check out how Grastoise holds up. Will now leads with a Bronzong. What is this thing? I have no idea, but it is Psychic and Steel type, and that I can work with. I set up a Swords Dance while he sets up a Reflect. This prompted me to set up a second SD before going on the offense. With that Reflect up, we're dealing about half damage right now to Bronzong, but it doesn't stand up for much longer. The Reflect will be up for a couple more turns, but after taking out Bronzong, we don't care. Plus four super effective crunches tear through Will's team. Jinx, Grumpig, Slowbro, Gardevoir, which is awesome, and his typical Ace Zatu all fall in short order. That's one out of four League members down. Because I'm super original, you'll never guess how I lead off the battle against Koga. That's right, with a sword stance as his lead Skun Tank goes underground. Bad news for you, buddy, as our plus two stab super effective Earthquake gets the one shot, which was also dealing double damage because we Earthquaked him while he was underground. Poor Skun Tank did not see that one coming. At plus two, we start working our way through his team with plus two stab earthquakes, when against Crobat, our crunch misses the one shot. We end up poisoned as he switches into Toxicroak. I'm guessing the AI was hoping to switch into a resisted move, but that resisted plus two crunch just one shot Toxicroak. Crobat's back out and we continue slugging away with more crunches as Koga heals, but that poison damage is really starting to stack up. It was a toxic after all, not a standard poison. Crobat falls with Swalot coming out next, but that poison damage is starting to deal some serious hits. One more plus two stab super effective Earthquake takes out Swalot, and the poison damage takes us down to 27 hit points. Muck is the last one to join the battle, and thankfully one final Earthquake does the job. One more turn and we would not have survived. That's about as close as it gets, but hey, that's another first try victory. Let's move on to Bruno. I'm starting to feel like I should just skip talking about the first turn of battle because I'm always just setting up a swords dance. I decided to see if plus two stab Razor Leafs were gonna be enough for Hitmontop, and unfortunately, they're barely not, leaving him in red bar. I continue going with Razor Leafs, actually with a fair amount of success carving through all of his Hitmons, Top, Chan, and Lee. It's when Hariyama hits the field that we're in a little bit of trouble. Our first Razor Leaf misses while he uses Bulk Up, and then our second one fails to get the one-shot because he increased his defense, and he takes us out with a low kick. That was a low blow, man. In the next attempt, I followed the exact same strategy, gumming up to Hariyama. This time, though, since he's going for Bulk Up on the first turn, I switched to set up a couple more Swords Dances. Actually, it was just the one sword stance, but then we turn around and take out Hariyama with a plus four stab earthquake. Lucario is out next, be still my heart, and poor Lucario has the steel typing falling to another plus four stab super effective earthquake. Machamp is last on the field with four arms and no hope. One final EQ cleans up the battle, so let's move on to member four, Karen. Karen, though, is gonna be a massive problem. You know how I just said that I spend the first turn of battle setting up Sword Stance every time? I don't think that's gonna work against Weavile. Weavile is gonna be a nasty lead to go against, as I cannot get a setup because he's faster than us. The fact that he's faster than us wouldn't have mattered if his Ice Punches didn't hit us for nearly 80% of our health. We fall before we can even get out a single turn of damage. 
Five attempts later and I've changed my strategy a little bit. I've taught TM80 Rock Slide over Razor Leaf as Razor Leaf has really been falling off for us. It's only 55 base power after all. We get super lucky here as Weavile goes for Night Slash instead of Ice Punch and Rock Slide gets the one shot. Alright, let's see what else this battle holds. Honchcrow is next, who were faster than taking the opportunity to set up a single SD, but their drill peck hurts. We're brought down to a little over a third, and I'm hoping that plus two is gonna be enough. Houndoom is next, outspeeding and hitting a stab, super effective flamethrower, finishing the battle. This was my sixth and best attempt at Karen, and that's what it looked like. It's time to leave the league and do a bit of grinding. Jumping ahead around 13 minutes and 10 resets, I've been grinding against the League and still attempting Karen. At level 81, I'm finally implementing that Quick Claw that we picked up in the National Forest way back in, like, Goldenrod. I've been fishing for a Quick Claw activation against Weavile because hoping for that Night Slash was way too inconsistent. At level 81, without the setup, we are able to take out Honchcrow in a single shot with super effective Rock Slide. I still have a lot to learn and confirm about this game, but I'm assuming that this Houndoom has a neutral nature concerning its speed, which means it has 144. That means that we finally outspeed it now, taking it out with a single stab super effective earthquake. Oh, feels good. Spiritomb is next, and since this thing looks ghostly, I thought that Crunch was gonna be the best option. Turns out it's ghost and dark, so we hit for neutral damage dealing less than half. This results in us being cursed by Spiritomb, and unfortunately, with only two Pokémon left on her team, we cannot get the victory this time. The bulk of her Pokémon, plus the damage every turn from Curse, was just too much. Seven attempts later, and I got my Quick Claw again, so we can discuss what I tried this time. As Spiritomb once again hits the field, you'll notice that we took a little bit of additional damage this time because I did take a turn to set up against Honchcrow. Plus two, Stab Earthquake takes it out in a single shot this time. Umbreon is next, and I've noticed that Umbreon likes setting up Curse turn one, so I decided to go for another Swords Dance. This definitely puts the damage range in our favor, hitting another Stab Earthquake taking Umbreon out in a single shot. Oh right, these teams have six members. Absol comes out after that, and it's no surprise that one final Earthquake cleans up the battle. That was a hard-fought Karen battle, and I have some bad news. Lance is way harder. Alright, Lancey boy, he's been referred to a lot in Generation 2 as the liar with the flyers, but in the Generation 4 remakes, this team makes him feel like an absolute dragon master. He leads with Salamence, who's going to intimidate us at the start of every battle, so that's unfortunate. I try setting up a sword stance and taking him out with Rock Slide, but since he's faster than us and just happens to land a critical, we fall to a super effective flamethrower. Jumping ahead another 5 minutes and 10 resets, I've left the league doing one more grinding pass, but then also tied into our rare candies. At this level, I'm now attempting this battle using the strategy of sheer might. I've got the Shell Bell equipped to help us with some recovery throughout, setting up one turn of SD against Salamance before going on the offense. He's still faster than us, cooking our health down to 98, but the Shell Bell does give us a little bit of recovery. We're able to one-shot Charizard with our plus two four times super effective Rock Slide, but miss the one-shot against Gyarados. You just gotta love the steady stream of Intimidates we're taking. Gyarados puts some pain back on us with a four times super effective Ice Fang, but Lance heals him on the next turn and it seems that Rock Slide is a range, taking him out on the next turn. His Ace Dragonite is next and once again, thankfully, we were able to one-shot with super effective Rock Slide. Deep breaths, man, deep breaths as Garchomp hits the field. I am genuinely terrified of this thing switching to Stab Earthquake and hoping we get the one-shot. Wow, my nerves during this battle, oh my goodness. Altaria is out last with one final rock slide ending not only this battle, but the round two Pokemon League. With the run now beyond the three hour mark, you can see what I mean by these runs take a long time. For all of you out there, I have some good news. We're still not done. I know that there are a ton of other gym rematches and other post-game content, but I only have one target left in this video. First though, Grastoise clocks in with a round two time of three hours, six minutes, and 33 seconds at level 90 with 68 resets. This took nine hours and 15 minutes of game time. The final leg of our journey leads us all the way up Mount Silver. 
This is one of the most remote and harsh areas of the entire region, and what better place to face down against the most powerful trainer in the game? We defeated Blue earlier, but we all know who Blue has always been jealous of. It's time to challenge Red. Grastoise actually has a phenomenal advantage in this battle, and that advantage is our typing. Red has an incredibly diverse team, but this lead Pikachu is a menace. It's holding a light ball, so when it hits you with a Volt Tackle or a Thunder, it hurts a lot. Fortunately, Grastoise doesn't really care about electric moves, shrugging off Pikachu's Iron Tail and taking it out with a single stab super effective Earthquake. In this first battle, I wanted to see just how much damage we were able to do without any setup, so I went straight for Rock Slides against Lapras, missing the first one. We're dealing some pretty decent damage, not taking a ton in return, but then Charizard hits the field. He outspeeds, hitting a monstrous Flare Blitz, taking us from nearly full health to nearly zero health. Like, the recoil damage of that hit almost dealt a third back to him. We hit through with our Rock Slide, taking him out, but at only 24 health, I'm not feeling great about the rest of this battle. Snorlax is next, and our Stab EQ is doing about half to him as he finishes the battle with a 100% because of the Hail Accurate Blizzard. As I mentioned earlier, I was having some technical problems with this run, and I was faced with a choice. In this area, you can actually set it to be a specific date and time so that there will not be a hailstorm. One of the most common dates that I see used is October 11th, which will in fact get rid of this hail. I was faced with the decision of either getting rid of the hail to have a slightly easier red fight, or having the live updating stats. Just because I love you guys so much, I'll go with the harder red fight to keep the stats going. I've been mixing things up a little bit in the next attempt, actually making it past Snorlax this time, but then we're faced with a Blastoise. Blastoise then outspeeds us, hitting one of those 100% accurate blizzards, and once again ending the battle. I used another two rare candies, leveling up to level 93, and I'm trying to get my setup in against Pikachu. It's odd calling Pikachu the least threatening member of his team, but hey, ground type. Pikachu still manages to deal about half to us as I knock out Lapras with that beautiful Shell Bell recovery helping us out a little bit along the way. The unfortunate bit about this is that Charizard is super fast. Still like 30 points above us fast, so we're not going to be outspeeding him even at level 100. Despite the best efforts of the Shell Bell recovering us, another Flare Blitz takes us out. After playing around a little bit more, I decided that the setup against Pikachu is worth it despite the risk of Iron Tail and the defense drops which would end us. I get my plus two against Pikachu, taking it out with Stab Super Effective Earthquake and then Super Effective Rock Slide for Lapras with four times Super Effective Rock Slide taking out Charizard. Our Shell Bell bounces us back just over half health as Snorlax hits the field. With our setup and Snorlax's slightly weaker physical defenses, we can take him out with a plus two Stab Earthquake. It feels good, and it's about to get that little bit sweeter as we take out Blastoise as well in a single shot. This leaves Venusaur in the back, so our Earthquake against the Grass Poison type is neutral, taking it out in a single shot. For Grastoise anyway, the red battle could have been worse. With red defeated, we see Grastoise's final completion time for this playthrough. 3 hours, 11 minutes, and 55 seconds at level 93 with 72 resets. What. A. Run. I obviously have a ton that I still need to learn in this game, but I really hope that you enjoyed one of my first cracks at running this game solo. We don't have any established data points, and since I'm not optimizing for a second playthrough today, I'm only going to be focusing on our finish times. Given that Grastoise would be the only Pokémon on a tier list this week, I'm just not going to make one. Over the last couple of months, I've been focusing so hard on trying to make my gameplay better and learn all these things about SoulSilver, when really, I should have just been playing it. Practice, 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 plus your feedback helps to make me a better player. So, if you feel like I've earned it, be sure to leave a like and comment about the run, what you'd like to see in the future, or just to say hi. Please don't be too shy about leaving constructive criticism, just please make sure it's actually constructive. With that though, I'm out of things to talk about with Grastoise's run. I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. Your support makes these videos possible, so I can continue to put as much effort as possible into producing this content for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. 
I'm looking forward to seeing you next week as we continue our Soul Silver Starter series with Chimchar. Also, you may have heard me teasing a little bit about the upcoming stream on Tuesday, March 12th. We will be joined by another creator, the one, the only, Scott's Thoughts. Like, I can't even help myself, guys. I'm like breaking out in a big smile as I'm saying this. I cannot wait, and I hope to see you there. Until next time, take care, everyone. <laughs>